Union, your director, speaker, the voice of prophecy broadcast. And here in the recording studio with me today is my father, Dr. H.M.S. Richards, founder of the program. We're here for a very special reason. I'm going to be interviewing my dad about Ellen White and her writings. And I hope that at least some of the questions I ask him will be just the ones you'd want to ask him if you were right here with us. Well, Father, as far back as I can remember, you have believed that Ellen G. White had the gift of prophecy. Would you tell me something about how that belief began to take root in your mind? For example, did Grandfather become acquainted with Ellen White, and did he influence your attitude toward her? No doubt he did, because he believed in the spirit of prophecy as taught by Seventh-day Adventists, and he was a minister of the faith. Of course, I was born into that family. Mother and father believed this, talked about it. Father knew Sister White, had several experiences with her personally. He knew the background of the church history. Many of the people, in fact, most of the men we call pioneers who were with Sister White were still alive at the time he started his ministry. In fact, many of them were alive when I started the ministry. They were alive around 1914. Sister White, Willie White, her son, Elder Loughborough, I knew these people personally. And uh, Elder Chad Butler, I knew him. Elder Haskell, many others. So I suppose one big reason I've always believed in the spirit of prophecy is manifested in the work of Sister White is because I knew Father and I knew these people and they all believed in it. And I thought the arguments that they used were pretty good ones, too. Tell me how Ellen White impressed you when you personally met her or heard her speak. You were quite a little fella, I understand, when you first saw her. What did you notice about her that was so special? Well, she was very motherly and friendly. When I first met her, she had my brother on one side and me on the other, put her arms around us and treated her just like we were her grandchildren. But, of course, we were real small then. Was, I was about 15 when I really understood what she was and what she did and heard her preach the first time in Boulder, Colorado. In fact, I was then as tall as I am now, but just planning to be a preacher, that's all. I was one of the boys on the campground to help put the furniture in the tents and so on. And she came there with Willie White, Miss McIntyre for her nurse, and she was to speak to us all. There was a big crowd there in a, a building, if I remember right, it's an octagon building with an iron roof right there at the base of the Red Rocks in Boulder, Colorado. She was on a platform not more than a foot and a half high, I would say, and about 25 feet from me. I was on her left to one side. There were many people there. I should judge uh, probably a third of them or half of them were Seventh-day Adventists, the others, other Christian denominations. She dressed very plainly, I believe a silk dress, a black silk dress. I they think. all came to see that Adventist prophet. Oh, didn't yes, they? that was it. And she talked for about 30 minutes. She used many texts, probably nearly 100 by least reference, and uh, talked 30 or 40 minutes. Real good talk, just like a dear Christian mother talking to her children and those who loved her. And then Willie White, her son, came up and in a matter that she not got too tired. They had to go a long way on the train again and you should be careful. So she said, well, I'll finish in a minute or two and then I want to pray before I sit down. And uh, she finished up right away. Then she kneeled down and began to pray right there a few feet from me. And as she began to pray, a change came over things. It came over me and over all the people, too. It was a very strange thing. When she was preaching, she was just a good, earnest Christian mother, preaching, talking. When she knelt down and began to pray, she started the words, Oh, my Father. She didn't say Our Father, but My Father. In a few moments, it was clear that she'd forgotten all about us. 
she was talking to God, and it seemed that he must be talking to her. A power came over the meeting. I was almost afraid to look up for afraid I'd see the Lord there. And back in the audience, people began to weep and sob about their sins. She used no deathbed stories. She didn't make any oratorical pull or anything. But a mighty power came in. And people were being led to the Lord just by the power of the Spirit of God. That's my memory of it. And I'll never forget it. It was really a, a sort of a, of a change in my life from then on as I was heading for the ministry. And I'll never forget it. I've noticed that above your desk you've got three rows of books by Ellen White. And they look like they've received a lot of wear. And as I open the pages of these books, uh, I see many marks inside, too. Well, why do you read them so much? Are they really that worthwhile? Well, I think they're one of the finest spiritual commentaries on the Scripture. If God does have in the world, or did have in the world, someone invested by a special spirit of prophecy, it would be natural that we ought to pay some attention to it. And I think the best way for one to judge whether those writings are what we believe they are, is to read them. Their effect, as far as I know, has always been good, been a blessing on everyone who reads them. They have been, to me, a very great blessing. Uh, now, Dad, you've always told me that when I'm meeting the public, you know, when I'm preaching or out giving a Bible study to some interested person, I shouldn't use her writings as authority for the truths I'm presenting. Now, why have you told me that? Well, of course, the Bible is the basis of all our faith. I would say that her writings were not given for that purpose at all. We distribute thousands of them. They're good. They bring people to the Bible. And she said herself that the Bible is to be the source of all authority. Let us lift up the banner inscribed, the Bible, the rule of faith and discipline. That was one of the statements she made. The testimonies were not given to take the place of the Bible. Here's another statement from volume 5, page 665 of her writings. If you had made God's Word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies, would not have needed her writings. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes. She gave them to draw us to the Bible. At various times, she said things like this, we must sink the shaft deeper and deeper in the mine of truth and study the Word of God more and more. That's the center of our authority. I'd like to tell you also what happened when she attended the West Denver Church where my father was pastor. Well, the last song had just been sung and father had just arisen to preach. As he approached the pulpit, he saw the front door of the church open, and in walked Sister White, Willie White, Miss McInturfer. They had come through Denver on their way east, and he didn't know they were in the country. So Father invited them up on the platform. They came, and he asked her to preach. There before the people, she said, Did you plan to preach today? Yes, he said. Did you ask God to give you a subject? Yes, I did. Did you think that he did give you a topic? Yes, I did. And you studied for it? Yes. Well, then she said, I wouldn't think of preaching. I want to hear what God told you. And she made him preach. He was just a young preacher. It was quite an experience for him. And when he finished, she did a wonderful thing. It was wonderful to me, it seems. She took him off to one side after service had closed, and she talked with him. She told him that she was blessed by his sermon. And uh, she didn't have to say that to a young fellow. That was of the kindness of her heart. It's an example for us. If a man says something good, let's encourage him. There are many preachers who are discouraged, and they need to be encouraged. So it was with Dad. And she encouraged him. And then she said to him, if you keep on using your voice like you do now, you keep on talking as you talk now, you will not live long. You will die soon. She told him that he was straining his voice and that he was not getting good physically from his preaching. 
and she gave him about 10 or 15 minutes instruction how to throw his voice out, how to speak, how to breathe, and so on. And he said that he learned more in that 15 minutes with her than he did in all of his courses in public speaking in Battle Creek College. So Father never forgot that, and he often told me about it, gave me different details about it. She knew the principles of speaking. Then Father asked her a question. He'd seen ministers going to the pulpit with armloads of the red books, which they would read right along with the Bible. He said, how should we use your writings in preaching? He wasn't asked about asking her about holding a Bible study on the spirit of prophecy or giving a study on the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. That would be a different thing. But in regular preaching, how should I use your writings in my regular preaching? Now, here's what she told him. She said, when you decide to preach on a certain subject, go to the Bible and study the Bible, go all through the Bible until you know everything you can find out about that subject as far as the Bible touches on it. Be sure you know what the Bible really teaches about that subject. Study it thoroughly. And then when you've done that, then you can go to some of these writings that cover the same area, subject or time, and whatever it is, you may look it up there, you might find a ray of light, something that illuminates the subject for you, gives you a little more idea of how to make it clear to people. Then she said, go back to the people and preach that wonderful truth to the people out of the Bible. Now that's in harmony with these other statements she's made. That's what she told Father, and as you know, he and I have tried to do that. I've tried to do it. I've tried to suggest it to my own sons and everyone I know. I've tried to teach you boys, as you know, to do the same thing. And I believe that's right. I believe that's the way we're supposed to do as we teach the Word of God. Well, that's pretty clear. Now, Father, would you tell me, and those listening just briefly, how your belief in the spirit of prophecy fits in with the idea that God's people are living near the end of time? Well, just before ancient Israel went into the land of Canaan, God led them by a prophet, a great prophet, Moses. And he died just before they went into the land. Sister White is sleeping now, waiting for the resurrection of the saints. We hope soon that God's people will be redeemed from this earth to enter the heavenly Canaan. And also, we should remember that according to the scriptures, Revelation 12, 17, for instance, and Revelation 19, 10, the spirit of prophecy was to appear among God's remnant people, his last church in this sinful world. If these are the latter days, and if we're included among God's remnant, we should expect the spirit of prophecy to have some part in it. Amen. And I'm glad we have it. It's been a great blessing to me, and I know thousands of others have been blessed by it. And we will be blessed until Jesus comes as we follow the teaching of the scriptures on these things. Do you have any words of advice to the person who may be just becoming acquainted with the writings of Ellen White? Well, to such a person, I would say read the writings for yourself. See how they fit into the last day picture and the needs of the world today. They were written quite a while ago, but they picture this time. I'd especially recommend you read Steps to Christ on how a Christian life is started and carried on. Get the spiritual background of this message with the desire of ages, that wonderful spiritual life of Christ. And then the great controversy, which brings us right down to the stirring events of the last days. In fact, it's the last chapter just in the final history of the world. Then read her other books, some on health, on home, on study, on family life, books for nurses and students, doctors, preachers, I think you'll find that the whole library of these wonderful books is uplifting and in harmony with the Bible. She plainly told us to test her writings by the Bible. They're not to take the place of the Bible at all, but to draw us to the Bible. She always upholds the Bible as the fountain of all truth. Don't just pick out something here or there. Why, there are many things in the Bible itself that are hard to understand. If we took just those, we would soon lose faith in the Bible. If that's all we study, we should read the whole Bible until we get the impact of the whole thing. It should be so with these other writings. It's the only fair way to do. Occasionally we hear people criticize Ellen White, and a whole books have been written to prove she wasn't a true prophet. Would you make some comment on that? 
Well, the comment is that I've been a regular full-time worker under conference leadership since June 1914, and all during this ministry I've believed in the spirit of prophecy. All during that time, from then till the present, I've seen many critics of the spirit of prophecy come and go. I've read several books against the spirit of prophecy, major books, and I haven't found much of anything that I hadn't read before. In many pamphlets or heard in speeches, they're all mostly a rehash of past generations of critics. I think one good thing the critic does is to make a study deeper of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I'm not afraid of these books, but I don't think people should pick them up and read them if they've never read the spirit of prophecy for themselves. Father, I think it would make a, a very fitting conclusion to our interview here if you'd just read something to us from one of the books of Ellen White, something that's blessed your own heart. All right, son. I think I'll choose a few paragraphs from the last pages of the book Great Controversy, which is the final book of the five volumes called the Conflict Series. These five volumes cover the whole spiritual history of the world from creation to God's wonderful world of tomorrow after Jesus comes, that new world, the eternal home of the saints. I'm going to begin on page 675, where we read these words, In the Bible... The inheritance of the saved is called a country. There the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living waters. The tree of life yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There are ever-flowing streams clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows upon the paths, prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There the wide-spreading plains shall swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers shall find a home. And then the writer quotes from the prophet Isaiah, My people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Then on the next page, follow these words. Pain cannot exist in the atmosphere of heaven. There will be no more tears, no funeral trains, no badges of mourning. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. The inhabitants shall not say, I'm sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquities. From Isaiah 33, these wonderful words. You notice the servant of the Lord uses these wonderful passages from the prophets of the Bible in picturing the home of the saved. And then she continues, In the city of God there shall be no night. None will need or desire repose. There will be no weariness in doing the will of God and offering praise to his name. We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning and shall ever be far from its close. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. The light of the sun will be superseded by a radiance which is not painfully dazzling, yet which immeasurably surpasses the brightness of our noontide. The glory of God and the Lamb floods the holy city with unfading light. The redeemed walk in the sunless glory of perpetual day. A little farther on, page 677, we find a beautiful picture of the redeemed themselves. Notice now, there the redeemed shall know even as also they are known. The loves and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul shall there find truest and sweetest exercise. The pure communion with holy beings 
the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, the sacred ties that bind together the whole family in heaven and earth, these help to constitute the happiness of the redeemed. Now to me the words that follow are among the greatest ever written on this subject. Their immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There will be no cruel, deceiving foe to tempt to forgetfulness of God. Every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased. The acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realized, and still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of mind and soul and body. All treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. And the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Aren't those inspiring words? They make me want more than ever to keep my faith in Jesus. How about you? I hope you feel the same way. Every time I read those beautiful words, I'm encouraged to keep my faith whatever task may come and let Jesus lead me into the heavenly land.